Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Winter 2021 uh, CJS Thursday Lecture Series. My name is Greg Lawrence, and I'm a professor of management at UM Flint and director of graduate studies for CJS. Um, before we get started, I have a couple of announcements. Um, first, please join us next Thursday, the 8th of April of 2021 for David Michener, curator of the Matai Botanical Gardens and Nichols Arboretum College of Literature, Science and the Arts and Vice Provost for Academic Graduate Studies and Carmen Leskoviansky, Collections and Natural Areas Specialists, speaking on unseen artists in a theater of timeless pace, iconic bonsai inspire iconoclastic futures. Sounds like a, a super interesting talk and hopefully we'll see everybody here for that one as well. Uh, for other programs scheduled in the lunch series, please check out the CJS events page um, or uh, look for the Center for Japanese Studies on your favorite social media outlet. Um, finally, you've probably noticed this, but attendee webcams and microphones have been muted for the webinar, but we invite you to use the Q&A function during the lecture to submit any questions that you have, and the presenters will try to address as many of those as we can uh, following the talk. Okay, so today's speaker is Dr. Masaki Mike Kotabe, who holds the Washburn Chair in International Business and Marketing at the Fox School of Business at Temple University. He's worked closely with leading companies such as AT&T, Kohler, NEC, Nissan, Philips, Sony, and 7 and i Holdings, and served as advisor to the United Nations and World Trade Organization's Executive Forum on National Export Strategies. Professor Katabe was elected a fellow of the Academy of International Business in 1998 and served as its president in 2016-17. He was also elected a fellow of the Japan Academy of International Business Studies in 2017. He served as editor of the Journal of International Management from 2002 to 2019 and has authored more than 150 scholarly articles and more than 20 books. Most recently, he received a gold medalist award from the Academy of International Business as one of the most published researchers in the world over the past 50 years in the Journal of International Business Studies. So without further ado, welcome Professor Katabe and the Zoom floor is yours. All right, well, thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation. Um, well, today, um, actually, I'll be talking about something very interesting. And the title that I was given, uh, Contrast in US-Japan Global Supply Chain Management During the Coronavirus uh, Pandemic. And in fact, uh, the supply chain issue, uh, even though I, I stated during the coronavirus pandemic, uh, it precedes coronavirus pandemic, and of course, um, it's, it's, it's been going on. And there seems to be a fundamental difference between the way uh, American firms and Japanese firms practice uh, supply chain management. It's, it's just one of them. Uh, employment system, uh, human resource management, uh, marketing, uh, there are fundamental differences. And I'm not saying which is better or which is worse. It, it just depends on what the uh, uh, company's objectives are, which may, which I may touch on it toward the end of my talk today. So let's start with the PowerPoint. Uh, okay. So I mentioned uh, the title for the talk, uh, for my talk. Um, well. Basically, I would like to deliver uh, three observations today. Uh, the first one is very broad, the impact of coronavirus uh, pandemic on the world economy, particularly the US and Japan um, as, as our foresight. And uh, the second one is look at the same issue from the Japanese perspective, Japanese economy and Japanese companies in the world economy. And then the third one, is the uh, somewhat historical uh, related, well, I will try to relate what happened about 20 years ago to what is really happening today. It's really continuous uh, flow of changes we have seen uh, ever since Asian financial crisis, as you know, 1997 and 98 um, occurred. So anyway, so let's get started with uh, the first one. 
the impact of coronavirus on world economy, uh, particularly the US economy. And uh, first of all, as, uh, as a reference point, um, the US economy is still the largest in, in the world. Um, China, as you know, uh, has been catching up, but in terms of uh, uh, purchasing power, uh, Chinese uh, today are able to purchase more than Americans, I mean, in terms of local currency. And Japan uh, is about one fourth the size of the United States today uh, in terms of economic size, just as a reference point. Now, speaking of uh, Corona uh, virus situations, this is the latest statistics I was able to download from Statista. If you're interested, uh, you can look it up on your own. Uh, it's free of charge. Uh, the mid column is the percentage of cases per population. Uh, the United States about 9.17% 9 9 of the population, almost 10% of the population has already contracted the coronavirus. Japan, very low, 0 0.04. And then the last column shows the sad story, the number of deaths per million people. Uh, in the United States, almost 1,700 people um, have died per 1, 000, uh, 1 million uh, population base. And in Japan, only 72. So clearly, um, the way of course, I mean, you can look at the other, other countries. Uh, the United States looks the worst, but actually there is one more country that is worse than the US situation uh, on a population basis. Uh, UK is slightly actually worse than the US situation. And Japan is not really the best, but some uh, one of the, the countries that managed to have successfully managed uh, coronavirus, uh, at least compared to uh, USA, Brazil, UK, France, and so on and so forth. But anyway, so this is uh, what has been happening in the last year or so. And as you know, um, the coronavirus was reported around uh, January uh, a year ago. And uh, around April, that's around uh, the time when unemployment rate uh, started skyrocketing. And, and this is the uh, OECD uh, chart uh, that I was able to find. And uh, the USA it, uh, didn't behave well, clearly. The, the unemployment rate really skyrocketed. And Japan, uh, yes, unemployment rate edged up, not, not to the extent that we have seen uh, in the US though. And looking at the same thing, um, with numbers. So you can see the uh, how bad the US situation was from uh, last January to April, even though uh, since then uh, employment or, or unemployment situation has improved or employment rate has gone up significantly. Uh, but when it was worse around April and May, this is the st statistics. So January last year, we had in the US 3.6% unemployment rate in April, almost 15%. And if you look at the actual, uh, uh, in Japan, 2.4% moved up to 2.6%. Um, but once you see the actual number, that's what really uh, scares us. Uh, January 2020, we had 5.8 million uh, unemployed people and that, the number has gone up to almost 24 million uh, in, in a matter of three, four months. And Japan, 1.6 million edged up to 1.8. So again, uh, you can see uh, whatever reasons, I'm not gonna go into all potential reasons, but uh, there has been a structural difference in the way uh, the United States and Japan. And of, of course, if you're interested in other countries, you can look at those uh, and how they responded to uh, the coronavirus situation. <clears throat> and uh, uh, IMF also uh, predicted the economic deceleration as a result of the coronavirus uh, 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 situation. So the only country that uh, that they forecast to grow as uh, China, small 1%. You know, chi uh, China had been used to 7%, 10%, 12% annual increase. So 1% increase 
uh, is a quite uh, decline in, in the growth rate, but at least positive um, as expected by IMF. And uh, as you can see, Japan and the United States, uh, both countries, and of course, including other European countries, are expected to uh, decelerate, and as they did. Uh, the Japanese decline uh, was forecast uh, much lower than the US, as you can see. Um, and uh, looking at the uh, stock market prices since the, uh, uh, the beginning of the pandemic last year, last January, um, and as you can see around April, um, yes, uh, the stock prices literally around the world uh, dropped off the ceiling. And ever since uh, there have been uh, some improvement, and as you can see again, uh, just focusing on uh, Japanese Nikkei, um, and the Dow Jones average, um, the Japanese um, uh, Nikkei uh, stock index has appreciated uh, since last April, uh, almost 23% as opposed to Dow Jones uh, 7%. So no matter how you look at the coronavirus situation, um, Japanese for good or bad seem to have managed the coronavirus situation better in terms of uh, low unemployment rate, uh, um, better stock performance, and, and so on and so forth. And then uh, uh, economic growth, not as bad as, as, as the United States, at least. Um, then look at the uh, macro level statistics. Uh, this is the trading situation. Uh, from the U.S. perspective, uh, of course, long before the coronavirus, uh, two I'm showing 2011 statistics. And as you can see visually, uh, three major trading partners for the United States are Canada, Mexico, uh, partly because of uh, well, closeness and the North American free trade area agreement uh, among the three countries. And then outside of this NAFTA region, China um, has been uh, the largest trading partner. And if you look at the two lines, uh, clearly shows Chinese exports to the United States or regards it, uh, the United States imports from uh, China exceeded uh, the United States exports to, uh, to China. But anyway, this, as you know, during the uh, 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 Trump presidency, this had been a con uh, contentious issue uh, from his perspective or from the US perspective. So anyway, that's a trading situation uh, before uh, uh, the coronavirus crisis. Now look at the same thing from uh, China's perspective. Um, let me add these two. Uh, the first two, the first one is China's exports amount that percentage of, of China's exports to the United States. The second one is from Hong Kong. And if you look at the Hong Kong uh, uh, trade situation, the majority of products that are uh, uh, physically shipped out of Hong Kong uh, came from China uh, and are mostly destined uh, to the United States. So if you calculate uh, total amount of China's exports to the United States, or if you look at it the other way around, uh, US dependence on China, amounts to close to 40 some percent. Uh, 40 some percent of China's exports come to the United States. And the next country is actually Japan. And uh, the most of uh, the product that Japan imports uh, from China uh, uh, come directly from uh, places like Shanghai. Um, and uh, they don't, re they rarely go through uh, Hong Kong. So anyway, uh, 6.2, and I added some more, probably uh, at about 7% of uh, 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 China's exports to Japan, uh, or China's exports uh, to Japan amounts to about 7% of China's uh, exports. But anyway, uh, and as I said earlier, Japanese economy today is about one fourth the size of the United States. So one fourth, uh, 6.2 times four is about 24%, uh, 25%. 25%. Uh, 
so clearly looking at uh, the size of the US dependence on China or China, China's exports to the United States, uh, uh, clearly, relatively speaking, uh, US seems to be uh, importing a lot more uh, from China, uh, you know, given the size of the economy uh, relative to uh, Japan. So what really happened in a, in a, in a, a schematic, uh, if I explain it in a schematic fashion, the basically what we have seen in the last 10, 15 years is the increased uh, dependence of US farms or the United States on imports uh, with imports from China and of course exports to China included. So overall uh, US increased dependence on trading relations uh, with China significantly. And then of course in the last four or five oh, well, four years uh, during uh, Trump presidency, uh, he um, of course uh, single-handedly pointed out uh, China uh, to blame uh, for uh, US excess imports or China's excess uh, exports to the United States. Uh, wherever the truth lies, uh, he um, imposed hefty tariffs on imports coming from, uh, mostly coming from China, as we all know. And then unfortunately, coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, took hold. And the, for these two reasons, um, I'm sure you have uh, seen newspaper articles on this, your supply chain, so to speak, basically uh, imports, materials, uh, whatever uh, was coming from China had been uh, significantly disrupted. So to the extent American firms relied on a kind of just in supply of materials, components, or even finished products coming from Japan uh, were clearly uh, badly affected. And then relatively speaking, you can imagine more badly affected by, uh, than uh, was the case uh, with Japanese firms. So one tentative conclusion uh, one could make is, um, well, looking at the American situation, uh, US government's failure in coronavirus, uh, well, handling coronavirus situation, and that's a significant uh, problem we, we, had, uh, we have experienced. And second one is compared to uh, the Japanese situation, uh, even though many people say uh, Japanese companies have got rid of lifetime employment system, but indeed still uh, so-called employee loyalty to the company they work for still remains uh, fairly intact. So yes, uh, people may job hop uh, more in Japan, but there is still semi-lifetime commitment uh, from the uh, employees. And of course, uh, long-term employment contracts are in place still in Japan. And, and, and on the other hand, in the US, uh, there aren't many legal protections for workers. So workers uh, are easily um, uh, left un unemployed or lose their jobs more easily in Japan. I'm sorry, in, in the US. And third one is uh, we have economic lockdown and many countries have experienced lockdown and that resulted in uh, basically dismissal uh, of uh, workers who couldn't uh, resort to uh, telework. So the people in manufacturing sectors, people in uh, certain service sectors who could not resort to telework uh, lost their jobs. And, and, and that's what showed uh, the suddenly around April uh, unemployment rate uh, in the US skyrocketed. Um, but in Japan, um, actually Japanese government has never locked down the whole economy the way uh, the US and, and some other Western countries have done. So um, th uh, theirs is more of a po uh, recommendation, you know, to, uh, try not to come to work. Uh, so it's a recommendation. Uh, people, uh, people either uh, took a heed to it, uh, may not have heed, uh, heeded uh, to those, that I don't know. But in any case, uh, uh, unemployment rate in Japan 
uh, had not gone up uh, nearly as much as it did uh, in, in the US. Now, the last one, uh, you know, from various data I showed, uh, you can't really uh, relate the story to this underlying statement. In fact, as a result of this uh, more excessive reliance on, on, on uh, imports coming from China, many American companies uh, that uh, pursue economic efficiency, which I will talk about toward the end of uh, my session today, have uh, become um, inoperable uh, due to disruption of global supply chain. We talked about it. Um, so let's leave it at that. And then we will come back to this point later. And the second observation, it's uh, looking at basically the similar issue, uh, same issue from Japanese perspective. And what got me uh, interested when I looked at this statistic is when it comes to foreign direct investment, historically, American firms and European firms had taken the lead in uh, investing abroad. And, and of course, Japanese uh, had increased their investment, but usually they lagged behind uh, American and, and European firms. And, but in the last few years, lo and behold, um, Japanese foreign direct investment abroad has exceeded uh, anyone else's, including the United States. Uh, in the case of US firms, uh, 19, uh, uh, 2018, uh, there was a net decline, meaning uh, my, my gut feel is I don't know all the details. Uh, during Trump presidency, a lot of uh, American firms that dissuaded from uh, keeping operating in China. So they pulled back. And that's probably why uh, in terms of net flow of investment, uh, outward investment, uh, it showed negative amount. But in any case, Japanese, all I can say is in recent years, Japanese seem to be taking the lead in uh, increasing foreign direct investment, meaning setting up foreign operations uh, outside Japan. And, and then those are the two countries I focused on. And if you look at, again, uh, uh, Japanese foreign direct investment over the years, uh, this is a cumulative one. Uh, it's not year-to-year uh, -year investment over the years. Uh, if, uh, as you can see, um, uh, still Japanese seem to be investing more in Europe and, and North America, mostly the United States. Um, um, but if you look into some details, uh, what's clear to us is uh, for European markets and for North American markets, Japanese seem to be investing more in research and development uh, or setting up regional headquarters and sometimes manufacturing operations. So more into uh, the major corporate, um, what do you call it? Uh, management uh, related investments uh, are, are what, what seems to be happening. And uh, when it comes to uh, the investment in China uh, and, and Asia, uh, 2016 uh, seems to have declined. Uh, but to me, it's an, an anomaly. Uh, it, it, it hovers around 40% uh, 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 of all of, of the Japanese investment. Um, but what's happening is uh, actually this chart sh shows better what I mean to say. Uh, if you look at the number of Japanese companies manufacturing bases in those countries, of course, China, uh, USA, they have plenty and uh, not increasing significantly, but they have plenty of, of manufacturing operations going on uh, in those two countries. What interests me is the, the sudden increase or gradual increase in the number of, of uh, production operations in India and Thailand uh, uh, in the last, I, I would say, 10 years. So uh, what is what was happening or what has been happening is Japanese seem to be uh, setting up more manufacturing operations in India and Thailand, of course, in a broad sense, uh, in Asia. Um, 
and not increasing reliance on the Chinese uh, 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 operations. Okay, so what does that mean? Um, again, uh, tentative conclusion. Uh, as I said, historically, American and West, other Western companies have taken the lead in foreign direct investment abroad. But in the past uh, few years, Japan, uh, uh, Japanese firms have taken the uh, helm. So what does that mean? So clearly what we can predict is a significant change in the way Japanese are trying to uh, uh, manufacture and market the products around the world and probably more relying on uh, foreign production. And uh, as long as uh, you look at their investment in uh, uh, advanced countries like the United States in Europe, uh, they are setting up regional headquarters and increasing R&D and the building distribution channel to, to, to create, uh, well, they're basically transplanting Japanese operations as is uh, to those countries. But when it comes to manufacturing operations, as you, as you have seen, uh, the Japanese seem to be uh, increasing the number of places to be producing out of in Asia, particularly including uh, Thailand and India, uh, uh, of course, in addition to China. Now, uh, something I, I, I haven't shown uh, anything yet, but what, what is interesting is if you are interested in uh, what's known as Toyota's rescue, uh, reinforce supply chain under emergency. And once you read about it, it's, it's a fascinating uh, change in the way uh, Japanese, in this case, Toyota has initiated in managing supply chain. Uh, they have supply chains, uh, suppliers uh, scattered on a global basis, not only in China, but also in the US, Australia, Thailand, Germany, uh, Brazil, and so on and so forth. But as you know, the, once you have scattered supply chain, it's very difficult to, uh, uh, to keep track of, of how those suppliers are performing. So what uh, Toyota has been doing in the last 10 years is to make, uh, I use the word, actually their word is visible, make everything visible from first year immediate supplier to the second supplier, the supplies to to the first supplier and third, fourth, all the way to 10th suppliers. And of course, farther away uh, those suppliers are from the immediate first supplier, more difficult it is it would be for anyone to see what those suppliers are doing. They are performing at, at their capacity. Are they performing as promised? Uh, the quality of materials that they use are as promised. So farther away, the suppliers are more difficult. Uh, it is for Toyota or any um, uh, principal company to manage. But Toyota has been trying to make the whole supply chain all the way down to 10 suppliers visible. And actually uh, they have made it visible. And then uh, components, materials coming from all sorts of suppliers are categorized into eight groups in terms of uh, supply chain risk. And uh, uh, the more, uh, well, the riskier the supply chain disruption there could be, then uh, number three, um, the comp Toyota um, is trying to assess high risk components together with suppliers involved. And that's what uh, Toyota has been doing. Now, Toyota may be one step, two steps, maybe three steps, ahead of other uh, Japanese manufacturing firms in terms of uh, managing supply chain. But nevertheless, uh, they are setting the standard. They have set the standard. So naturally, uh, in years to come, other Japanese companies will definitely follow suit. So we are expecting what's likely to happen down the road uh, in line with this rescue. So third, uh, before giving you all, uh, 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 bringing you to the conclusions, uh, third observation, this is historical, which has little to do with 
of actually nothing to do with current coronavirus crisis. Uh, 20 years ago, when uh, so-called Asian financial crisis happened, uh, so many uh, Southeast Asian American country, uh, Southeast Asian countries, currencies uh, depreciated suddenly. In Indonesia's case, as much as 75% of rupiah against US dollar in a matter of, of a few weeks. And that's a significant collapse of, of their currencies. So I'm not gonna go into the reasons why it happened, but it did happen. And because it happened, uh, the companies have to struggle uh, with, with the reality of, of exchange rate, uh, sudden exchange rate uh, depreciation. So let's look at uh, one uh, page I, I took out of the uh, Economist magazine. Uh, uh, I was reading it. So just before the Asian financial crisis, just focusing on Indonesia, uh, uh, their GDP in US dollars was $226 uh, billion. And of course, rupiah converted to US dollars at that exchange rate moment in time. And then um, right after the Asian financial crisis, Indonesia's GDP, again, as expressed in US dollars, uh, went down to $51 billion. Uh, what it means is uh, Indonesian uh, uh, rupiah depreciated by as much as 75%. And that's what uh, exactly what, what it showed. Um, now, at this point, we don't have to look at the third column. So in terms of exchange rate, uh, Indonesian rupiah depreciated that bad. So from American companies' point of view, looking at the 1996-98 uh, economic situation, uh, argument went like this. Indonesian rupiah depreciated so badly, and the Indonesian economy had shrunk significantly, as, as, as you see, and therefore, uh, Indonesia uh, is no longer, or back then, was no longer a good market um, to stay in. So a lot of American companies pulled out of Indonesia. And, and that's the, like a news, uh, like storyline. But what really happened was, uh, in, because Indonesian rupiah depreciated so badly, let's say American companies or European companies operating in, in, in Indonesia, and particularly American firms are practicing uh, uh, so-called global sourcing or, or purchasing various supplies coming from uh, various countries, Japan, US, uh, Malaysia, Thailand, China, and so on and so forth. And now Indonesian rupiah depreciated so badly um, in the end, um, you know, in, in a short run, um, you can hedge the exchange rate, but in the long run, uh, reality kicks in. Uh, Indonesian rupiah depreciated so badly. So in terms, if you are trading in US dollars, uh, eventually to buy any materials coming into Indonesia, you would have to pay four times more in rupiah. Uh, so, uh, purchase price for all the materials coming in from abroad um, had gone up significantly. So as a result, if you're an American company operating in Indonesia, you realize that you could not be uh, producing anything. Uh, at a, you know, given the cost increase in rupiah, you would be getting priced out of the market. So as a result, uh, quite a few American companies pulled out of the Indonesian market. But interesting thing, what we saw in 96, 98 period, the Japanese companies stay there, not pulling out. So the question is why or how? And Nikkei Weekly had a, a survey of those uh, Japanese companies operating in Southeast Asia to see how they dealt with sudden depreciation of their currencies. So to make a long story short, production side, about half of them said nothing is happening. Uh, well, the answer is actually, they were procuring materials locally in local currency, exchange rate really didn't affect them much. 
And if they were affected, about 30% of them, they, uh, they said they tried to uh, produce more locally. So if you combine those, 70% uh, of the companies are, are either procuring uh, materials locally and producing locally. And selling side, marketing side, about 35% said nothing much uh, had changed. Again, the reason is they are producing locally, selling those things locally. Or if they are exporting uh, or doing some other things, those companies tried to minimize sales decline by uh, marketing those products more locally. So again, 70% of the companies are trying to become local or local enough in terms of procurement and in terms of uh, marketing. So again, what we saw 20 years ago is Japanese companies were making efforts to localize their uh, production, procurement, and sales even before Asian financial crisis. So during the crisis, they weren't uh, as affected, as badly affected as, um, uh, let's say, American companies. So, uh, well, uh, maybe repeating the same thing, the Japanese companies production procurement sales were more localized than Western firms that needed to pull out of, let's say, Indonesian market. So since the Asian financial crisis that happened 20 years ago, Japanese companies have taken a, the important thing is proactive strategy uh, to further increase local procurement rate. So they have been doing that for all these years. And <clears throat> um, so as a result, when coronavirus uh, 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 crisis happened, uh, again, uh, the Japanese uh, are locally procuring things, locally producing things, locally selling things. So they were not uh, nearly as badly affected by uh, 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 the coronavirus crisis. Uh, unlike, let's say, American company that uh, imported all sorts of materials from around the world. So, um, if I were to somehow uh, make more of an academic statement about this, um, in terms of uh, procurement or supply chain, uh, how localized your procurement activities are versus how dispersed, how globally uh, scattered your supply chain uh, system is. Um, so you can kind of see uh, two extremes. And likewise, managerial outreach, or should I say managerial control, um, it can be very strong, it can be very weak. That means hands off uh, kind of strategy. So if geographical outreach is more localized and uh, managerial control can be very strong by insourcing, but instead of purchasing materials, basically you move your uh, production subsidiary to Singapore, Indonesia, and manage the whole uh, sub, uh, local supply by yourself. That's what we call insourcing. Or uh, partnering with local suppliers, which we call alliance sourcing with local suppliers. At least you can exert stronger management of the supply chain in a localized fashion. And of course, you can purchase uh, those materials from independent suppliers in a localized uh, region, which uh, we call local outsourcing or local procurement. And uh, if you practice kind of dispersed, globally scattered supply chain, uh, and you just basically purchase materials produced by Chinese companies, Indonesian companies, um, on a, a short-term or sometimes long-term contractual basis. That's what we call traditional offshore outsourcing or commonly known as outsourcing. And then the lastly, uh, as I mentioned, the Toyota's rescue program uh, fits in globally scattered uh, mode of supply chain management, but trying to uh, manage the whole system um, uh, and keep it under control. So if I simplify it, American style of outsourcing has been historically 
offshore outsourcing. Uh, as 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 well. if you look at the uh, huge amount of imports, material imports coming from China, and that's what it is. Instead of managing your own supply chain, purchasing materials from Chinese uh, operators, with or without much of a control over it, whereas Japanese. Ten, uh, uh, practices tended to be either more insourcing, that means managing your own subs, uh, subsidiary uh, uh, supply, uh, supply uh, uh, basically subsidiaries producing supplies that they would need for uh, global production, or having local partners, in a, just like a Toyota group style uh, uh, alliance uh, form of supply chain. So you see some uh, significant difference. Now, and Toyota is one step uh, ahead of where most Japanese companies were, but that's the direction Japanese companies seem to be heading in. Okay, it's more of a conclusion. Japanese companies, as you may know, not related to supply chain. Uh, Japanese are known to emphasize effectiveness uh, customer satisfaction, whereas American companies tend to emphasize economic efficiency, or you might say profit maximization. So given that philosophical difference, um, clearly Japanese expanding their supply chain base not to become dependent on China for the sake of stability, uh, increasing investment in suppliers to strength, strengthen uh, their supply chain management and Toyota Rescue one, is one, uh, clearly one of them, it's, it's the direction the Japanese seem to be going in. And the uh, unfortunate thing about Japanese style uh, supply chain management is actually they are not as profitable. So profit margin will be impaired because in order to maintain stable supply, uh, you have to manage them, uh, control them and uh, uh, invest in them. So it costs you, so it may not be as profitable. So, and then of course, as I said, uh, the Japanese are, have been trying to localize their production and sales over the years, long before uh, coronavirus crisis. And this is uh, one way to see uh, where Japanese and American top and bottom, uh, Europeans in the middle come from. Americans indeed have historically much higher return on equity, meaning profit, to the investors, uh, much higher than that of, of Japanese firms. So what it shows is clearly when Japanese American executives plan out their supply chain, marketing, whatever other strategy do you think of, uh, they try to maximize the profit. Uh, their concern is more about profit uh, uh, increase to the investors. Whereas Japanese, they may be generating same amount of uh, revenue um, and a good portion of so-called profit margin may be allocated to uh, 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 increase production activity, increase uh, investment in better facilities, or increase mat uh, uh, the control of local suppliers. All of these things cost you. Um, and as a result, uh, the profitability in terms of return on equi equ uh, equity for Japanese firms have been historically low. So I'm not saying uh, American style is better or Japanese style is better. All I can say is historically it's been, uh, storyline has been consistent. Um, American firms uh, pursue economic efficiency. Whereas Japanese, uh, what I call, pursue economic effectiveness, get the job done regardless of the cost. American way of doing things is, is increase profit. And uh, as long as 95% of the uh, customer satisfaction or uh, supply chain objective is met, that is good enough, pursue economic efficiency. So that's the way I see it. Okay. Um, I know I spoke a little longer than 40 minutes, but any questions? Hello. Um, thank you so much for that fascinating uh, talk, Professor Kotabe. Um, so at this point, uh, we'd like to entertain any questions that any of you might have. 
for the um, for the for the presentation. You can type them into the Q and A tab at the bottom of your screen, um, and we'll answer as many as we have time for. So we already have a couple questions. So I'll begin with this one. Um, from Allison Alexi, uh, who writes, uh, thank you for this fascinating presentation. I have a very general question, uh, which is, do you have any thoughts about the recent Suez Canal situation? I think that's a moment when a lot of us who don't work in business were suddenly more aware of supply chains. Perhaps this is beyond your focus, but I would appreciate any thoughts you care to share. Thank you. Um, actually, I was expecting that question. And uh, um, Obviously, this sort of a thing rarely happens, just like a, a nuclear crisis, but it does happen. And uh, um, there's no, the problem is there's no solution to it. <clears throat> and in fact, uh, as you probably saw from the news line, the tanker or, or the, the freight ships are becoming larger and larger. So the only uh, long-term solution is to widen the Suez Canal. But again, who's gonna invest in those? So it has to be uh, just a Europe. I, I don't think it will be just Europeans problem. Well, this time around, uh, you know, Suez Canal, who, who would use Suez Canal? Most products coming from Asia going through Suez Canal to uh, Mediterranean, to Europe. So, that channel uh, had been clearly badly affected, uh, but it, this time around, it really didn't affect America. Most of, as you know, most of the manufactured products come from China. Whoever produces it, the, as you know, China had become a global uh, factory in a way. So most products come from, well, that come from China, go over the Pacific. So uh, at least from US perspective, um, it hasn't been affected. It became a big news, but to Europeans, it's a serious issue. Uh, well, now the, 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 there's a backlog of like 400 ships waiting. It may take another month or two. So during that time period, uh, Europeans will experience shortage of various products. And shortage means uh, uh, as long as demand uh, doesn't change, uh, reduction in supply means price increase. So um, their concern is at least for the next month or two, uh, inflation rate, if the demand did, doesn't decline, uh, uh, Europeans may face a serious inflationary problem. But in the long run, as I said, uh, I think there have to be a, a global or unified uh, dealing with the you know, some of those bottlenecks, Suez Canal um, is one of them. Uh, Panama Canal is another too. So uh, who's gonna invest in those? It's, it's kind of public good. Everybody wants to use it, but nobody wants to pay for it. Am I correct? <laughs> so it's a classic case of uh, uh, what economists call public good, just like a light from the lighthouse. Nobody uh, wants to pay for the lighthouse, but everybody wants to benefit from the light coming from the lighthouse. Uh, so there has to be some sort of global effort, whether it be by the United Nations or at least among the developed countries because they are the ones importing products from you know, places like China. Great, thank you so much for that answer, uh, Professor Kutabe. Uh, we have another question here from uh, Mio Osawa, uh, who writes, um, new companies like Tesla will likely change the supply chain um, via the vertical system and more integrated components. Probably the current Japanese supply chains may need to be modified. In addition, more EVs are coming and many component suppliers will lose business and the current supply chain uh, will collapse. So how do you think the Japanese automotive industry needs to be needs to evolve in order to survive this new trend? Um, I think um, uh, I'm sorry. And then it's clearly a loaded sure. question. Even looking at Tesla, um, as you know, Tesla invested significant amount in uh, the development of, of batteries in China. Right? Uh, they're not simply buying uh, batteries, but they are uh, producing 
uh, batteries. So in essence, they face the same uh, supply chain disruption. What, what if whoever would become a future president of the United States raised a serious trade uh, issue with, with China, uh, blocking Tesla from importing or purchasing their own batteries. So I, I don't see any, any significant change. And uh, uh, as I said, uh, the, if you look at the supply side, uh, supply chain side and production side, at least looking at Japanese in the last 20 whatever years since the, uh, or even before the Asian financial crisis of 97, 98, uh, consistently just looking at the span of 20 years, Japanese seem to be, seem to have been trying to localize not only the procurement supply chain side, but also using those supplies to produce things locally for local sales. So that's, even though Japanese may be operating on a global basis, but actually <clears throat> production, procurement, production and sales are becoming more local. Whereas <clears throat> um, ever since uh, Michael Porter, uh, many of the students recognize Michael Porter, uh, you know, the fourth, uh, but anyway, ever since Michael Porter popularized the notion of global strategy, uh, what he said was, look, uh, since markets are global, companies have to think globally. What he meant to say is, look at the whole world as a resource base. Certain things are uh, better done in certain countries. So uh, if you're interested in miniaturized manufacturing activities, and clearly back then Japanese were considered the best in that activity, move that aspect of uh, production activities to Japan. If designing is better done in the USA, keep the design function in the US. So basically what uh, Michael Porter popularized was very much scattered global supply chain, right? So certain things are, come from UK, certain things come from China, certain things come from other places and put them together uh, in, in certain regional markets and market them. So that's uh, what you might call a global supply chain, but what I call globally scattered supply chain. So unfortunate reality is uh, obviously Michael Porter has been very uh, influential in, in the way American firms operate. So a lot of American companies scattered the supply chain. So certain things come from UK, certain things come from China, certain things come from other places. Now, it looks pretty. I mean, academically speaking, it looks nice. We are global companies, but reality is uh, from Toyota's perspective, you can tell uh, how do you practice just in time when you have scattered suppliers all over the world? Just think about distance. Not only that, think about the fact that in the last 20 years, Exchange rate fluctuations are pretty much unpredictable, uh, not unpredictable, but very difficult to predict, you know, how exchange rate change. So exchange rate changes that occur on a global basis affects your pricing and costing too. So in a more complex, more, um, what do you call it? Um, well, the, if the exchange rates fluctuate and the longer the distance, actually global supply chain as dreamed about 20 years ago, which looks beautiful on paper, it's much harder to, to manage. So common sense has it, Toyota like localized, uh, you know, all the suppliers are located in the same city and same city means same currency too which makes your life easier. You don't have to worry about exchange rate fluctuations. Uh, you don't have to, um, to worry about uh, uh, just in time. I mean, distance is so close. And three, if you are um, in research and development, uh, we know that the, the technological, uh, whatever you call it, um, and why do we have uh, Silicon Valley 
you know, in, in, in a narrow area um, because interaction among engineers and, and uh, technology people um, is easier that way. So actually in many ways, localized activities are easier to handle than globally scattered ones. You got that? So if you see it that way, uh, Tesla seems to be still practicing, well, actually they're increasingly dependent on China uh, for a material supply. And of course their major market is China too. So in that sense, if you see it that way, is it local enough? Probably. But if you look, uh, if Tesla looks to Europe, Japan, South America, as part of their global market opportunities, uh, relative to what Japanese are doing, uh, I think Tesla is still more on a global uh, side. Great. That's the way I see it. But having said that, you know, so far it sounded as if Japanese practices were better, but from investors point of view, as I pointed out, American way of doing business is fundamentally more profitable than Japanese. So from investors point of view, one could argue American way of doing things it may not be perfect, but we can lower the cost. If something happens at, at uh, you know, 95% confidence level, statistical concept, 5% of the time mistakes or major problems occur, but 95% of the times we are doing well. So collectively, we are just fine. So that could be the argument. Whereas Japanese come from a different school of thought, uh, they want to satisfy customers no matter what. So the stability of supply is definitely important. Um, uh, and in the process, uh, doing so, as I said, they have to invest more in facilities, uh, more locally, uh, manage them locally, everything costs you. So their cost of doing business is much higher than that of typical American firms. So as a result, their profitability is not as good. So I don't know, uh, depends on whose perspective you want to take. Great, thank you for that explanation. Uh, we have another question here from Jessica McManus Warnell, who says, thank you for your very helpful talk. Could you please comment on your perceptions of how Japan-US trade will change under the Biden administration? Um, I, well, since I don't know what Biden will be doing, uh, but my gut feel is uh, uh, it will be a better uh, and friendlier relationship that we would expect between the two leader, I mean, the Japan side and the US side. Um, at least unlike uh, Donald Trump, uh, Joe Biden doesn't seem to be as contentious uh, when it comes to dealings with any foreign government. So probably what, what we will see is a smoother relationship. And, uh, but from the American point of view, as you know, previous chart shows, uh, trade imbalance, if trade imbalance is a bad thing, uh, a lot of politicians see it that way. Economists don't think that way, but, but anyway, if you see uh, polit uh, not political, trade imbalance, it is not with Japan anymore. In the 80s, yes, Japanese were exporting more than Americans are uh, exporting to Japan. So that's why there had been a uh, trade imbalance, Japanese uh, in black and, and US in the red, I mean, in bi bilateral relations. And as a result, when, for example, Reagan was president, uh, he did exactly what uh, uh, Donald Trump uh, did imposing hefty import duty on Japanese uh, SUVs, okay? Just like Trump did against the Chinese uh, imports coming from China. Uh, but those days were gone now. Uh, they're more imbalanced. So looking at statistics, if in imbalance politically is an issue, then it is clearly with China, not with Japan. 
Great, thank you. Uh, we have another question here from Esperanza Ramirez Christensen. Um, uh, she asks, uh, is the long-term employment policy also a factor in the lower return on equities of Japanese companies in comparison to US? No. Oh, uh, yeah. The preference for stability over profit. Uh, and then there's short, another question after that. Short and long answer is absolutely yes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the casually stated, <clears throat> whatever bad thing, uh, recession happens, coronavirus happens, the first thing uh, we do in the US uh, is to lay off people. But in Japan, usually, even to this day, that's the last thing companies resort to. So, uh, so clearly, you know, the statistics coming from last April, uh, you know, how, how rapidly unemployment rate skyrocketed in the US uh, compared to Japan, uh, it clearly shows that. So, so yeah, the key people employed, even though they really want, well, the companies really wanted to lay them off. So clearly cost them. So all these things, it's not just supply chain, uh, human resource management style or employment style, uh, marketing, customer effort for mar uh, customer satisfaction, everything costs you. So meaning every potential profit, well, profit that could have gone to the investors was spent on satisfying customers, keeping uh, people who should have been laid off, kept them uh, employed and so on and so forth. So, so clearly it's not just uniquely supply chain issues. That's across the board, um, the Japanese way of doing things I can't say it's bad. I can't say it's it's good, but you know, the, a lot of global media are heavily influenced by American view of the world, whether we like it or not. So then, corporate performance, particularly you know, measured by return on equity or recent return on asset, Americans boast much higher rate. So, and even Japanese executives are influenced by more of American view of the world. And, and they, they started arguing that they have to improve return on equity. So uh, I can't say, um, de again, depends on whose perspective you want to take. So as a follow-up, uh, thank you for that. Uh, as a follow-up, um, uh, Professor Ramirez Christensen has asked, um, also, uh, what do you suppose is the reason for the sudden rise in direct investment in India and Thailand compared to say in Indonesia? Um, to be honest, that I can't tell. Uh, I, I do not know the, the reason, um, but it's not really sudden increase. It's really in the last 10 years. Uh, part of the reason is uh, Prime Minister Modi um, was fairly close to the Prime Minister of Japan back then. And that could be one of the reasons why, uh, you know, improved relationship encouraging Japanese to invest in in, in uh, India and also Thailand, and I don't know the political relationship, but uh, Thailand um, has always been a favorite place for Japanese executives to uh, set up operation. Uh, and also, uh, you know, executives have personal time to travel too. So executives love traveling in Thailand. So for all these reasons, they probably may have felt much closer to uh, uh, Thailand. Great, thank you. We have another question here from uh, Feng Trong, um, who writes, uh, thank you for great insights about the global supply chain. Uh, what do you think about the impacts of the Olympic travel restrictions on the global supply chain in the context of the US and Japan relationship? Thank you so much. Um, probably, I, 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 I cannot understand the question. You mean the traveling to Japan and how do I think I think the it says here the Olympic travel restrictions uh -huh. uh, on the global supply chain. So I'm not sure. Well, all I can say is Japanese government uh, currently is prohibiting virtually anyone from traveling to Japan. 
And uh, they, they, uh, even during Olympics, as far as I know, <clears throat> um, trying to reduce the number of, of people involved in Olympics from coming into Japan, and of course, no tourists. So in that sense, uh, I think what they're doing is to just to try to satisfy uh, athletes, you know, who invested so many years for the game of Olympics. And, and uh, so it, I, I think the reason why Japan decided to go ahead with it is probably more altru for altruistic reasons than for economic reasons. You know, they had invested so much and it, uh, it, you know, in a private sector, a lot of companies, particularly hotel, you know, the tourism uh, in the industry, invested so much in attracting uh, uh, foreign tourists, and they are not coming. So clearly, uh, companies who have already invested so much must be suffering and will be suffering for for a while. And uh, the Japanese government that invested so much in uh, improving infrastructure. Uh, facilities for, to host the Olympics um, have to shoulder much of the cost. I don't think IOC or International Olympic Commission would um, pay it back to the Japanese government. So cost-wise, it's huge, but they are still uh, trying to run the show. So what kind of objective is that? It doesn't seem to be financial anymore. Now, supply chain, I, I don't know how it relates to product shipment. Um, it, it still goes on. Um, yes, uh, to the extent that uh, demand that could have increased in Japan if there were more travelers, um, whatever is needed to ship to Japan uh, may decline. But other than that, I don't see any strong link between supply chain issue and uh, uh, Tokyo Olympics. Great, thank you for that as as well. Um, and again, feel free if there are other questions that people have, please don't be shy and add them to the to the chat. Um, as a transition, I wanted to ask Professor Kotabe. Um, so, given your you know, range of interests and uh, the presentation that you've given today, is there a particular research that you're you're especially Kind of intrigued by or excited about in, in this area um, uh, that's that's kind of um, particularly in relation to uh, the pandemic but i guess kind of looking forward are there certain kind of trends that you're interested in, in investigating further or kind of either in your um, own work or with collaborators well you know clearly uh what toyota has been doing under the code name rescue is interesting I mean, operationally, it's, it's uh, clearly uh, they use massive amount of computing power to manage all these uh, far-flung uh, scatter supply chains, and, and, and that could be interesting because no other company has been doing it yet. I mean, to the extent Toyota has accomplished, so uh, that's intriguing. Um, but my interest, I don't know whether I should call it research interest or um, interest for the public at large is there are so many restrictions uh, in the US that make it difficult for, well, basically raising US purchase prices because of various US regulations. And in fact, before uh, we got started with this uh, talk today, we had about 15 minutes to uh, prepare for the talk. Uh, I mean, set up the whole thing for the talk. Um, I asked some of you a simple question. Uh, why prices in Hawaii are so much more ex uh, higher than mainland prices? And even though we all know that most of the product come from well, physically made in China, from China over the Pacific, Hawaii is on the way, and then to the mainland. So common sense has it, if you use just common sense, uh, the Chinese ship will stop over at Honolulu Harbor and offload certain amount of products for sale in, in, in Hawaii and move, you know, move on to Oakland, California for mainland 
market. And uh, uh, because of the kind of weird uh, American law jo known as Jones Act, it's illegal. Basically, the law prohibits foreign ship from stopping at any more than one US domestic port. So making it virtually impossible for Chinese ship to stop uh, in Honolulu. So they go all the way to Oakland, California, offload everything, and then put the small amount destined for um, um, Hawaii market on an America-owned, America-manned, America-flagged, America-built ship. By definition, it's 10, 20 times more expensive than using Chinese ship. No wonder why you know, people in Hawaii end up you know, paying much higher price on everything. Uh, so this sort of a thing is not well known to general public in the US. And then you, you can, I mean, the Jones Act, there are many more restrictions, but, but that's one of them. Um, to me, it's, it's ridiculous, to be honest. It, it's ridiculous, it, you know, the energy cost is just high. It, it's a sheer waste of uh, money in the process, burning more fuel on the ship too. So if you think about pollution, think about the cost, it just doesn't make any sense. Why couldn't politicians have the desire to dismantle this sort of a um, restrictive practices uh, imposed uh, on us, on consumers and uh, American businesses? So I'm more interested in those public policy issues because many of them are so convoluted. And even Jones Act was enacted in 1920. And we're talking about 100 years ago. So we live in a very different environment. So, and, and US shipping industry is not at all competitive. Quality of ships is poor. Cost of building ship is uh, astronomically high. Uh, we don't have a competitive advantage and yet the law still forces Americans to use America-owned, America-flagged, America-manned, meaning Americans have to be working. You can't rely on uh, foreign workers at lower wages uh, for various reasons. Um, so those are the kinds of areas. It's more of a public policy interest. I would like to educate American public about the ludicrousness of, of such laws in order to improve our not quantity of life, I would say quality of life by reducing unnecessary wasteful cost uh, in the way we live. Thank you for that. That's actually a, a really um, nice segue into our, our, I think what will be our last question here. Um, this is also from Alison Lexi. It says, um, uh, my sense is that the supply chain is largely invisible to most people. Do you think that's correct? Is that something that we should try to change, educate everyone more about supply chains? And this is, as she wrote this before you said what you just said. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so, I, so it sounds I, like the answer I, is yes. I agree. If you could expand, um, that'd be great. Probably, you know, just like adding some economic economic theory, demand and supply type thing in, in high school education, we should include supply chain uh, as part of, well, I don't know, maybe a social science uh, class. Because um, you know, according to uh, Department of Transportation Statistics, it's kind of scary. Um, you know, we buy an automobile, and whatever retail price is. Do you know what? Well, according to Department of Commerce estimate estimation, what percentage of of the retail price we pay at the dealership is actually supply chain related or logistics related? Simply movement of raw, you know, raw materials into a steel mill. And, uh, and then uh, uh, steel is shipped, uh, warehoused and it costs you. It's shipped to the actual manufacturing company, it, it costs you and warehousing costs you. And later on, if it's shipped across national boundaries, uh, there are tariffs and additional freight charge and uh, insurance just in case ship you know, breaks apart. Um, all sorts of things are so-called logistics or, or supply chain related costs. Do you know what percentage 
uh, the price you pay for an automobile at the dealership is actually supply chain related, just movement of things. 70%, 70%. So, and then supply chain involves physical movement. And, uh, you know, we are talking about pollution, um, excess, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, use of fuels. Um, so either way, reducing supply chain related cost along the way. Uh, it's enormous. In fact, uh, Peter Drucker, uh, who was a management guru in, in the 50s and 60s, long before Michael Porter became one, he wrote a uh, very influential book called The Practice of Management, I believe published in around 1960, in which he said, probably, uh, uh, how did he phrase it? Logistics would remain the darkest continent of business. What he meant to say is logistics will probably be least understood by businesses and of course business academic as well. So that's why even to this day, 70% 70 70 of the price you pay is just a movement of things. I'm not talking about materials cost, movement of things. So if we could squeeze 10%, that could improve our quantity of life, quality of life, uh, reduced uh, use of fuel, you name it. So, so to me, that sort of a thing should be woven into basic education at, uh, high, at least high school level. That's the way I see it. Great, thank you for that, that really fascinating um, insight. I mean, I'm, I'm struck by I'm just trying to think about reasons for that um, and what it means to to de-emphasize to, to emphasize consumption at the expense of thinking about logistics, say, and how that has a kind of trickle down effect mm -hmm. in the worst way in terms of now we're thinking much more about the inter the environmental effects of these kinds of things, but not having a sense of how that relates to production or or um, uh, these different aspects of logistics, the connection between those two things seems like something that should definitely be explored further. So thank you for that. So I think we have one time for one more question. Actually, this is from colleague, Professor Yuki Shiraito, uh, who writes, uh, it seems that you're focusing on large manufacturing firms like Toyota, but I'm wondering about your perspective on COVID crisis responses by other firms, more domestic in service or agri agricultural industries and reliant on quote, irregular employment, sort of like Frita and so forth, presumably, um, or foreign trainees. They seem to be more likely to lay off workers, et cetera, no? Uh, yes, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I agree. It's a uh, chain of, it's, it's a chain reaction. So in the end, yes, uh, probably la large uh, shipping industry may handle, may end up handling product produced by small company or small farmers. So yes, my focus has been on big farms. So if you look at chain effect, uh, which is very true and it could multiply. Uh, so yes, uh, smaller firms have been affected. Smaller farms have been affected and a lot of them lost their jobs, we know it. Um, but again, <clears throat> if we had more streamlined, uh, and the same logic should have applied to Japanese, but luckily uh, because larger companies are emphasizing more about local production, local sales. So over the years, uh, if you take it to the theoretical extreme, everything is local. Exchange rate won't affect you coronavirus won't affect you. I mean, that's a theoretical extreme. So in that sense, uh, they may be ahead of the game. Uh, so as a result, um, small firms and small farms uh, employees may not have been as badly affected as, as, as was the case in the US. Great. Well, thank you for that, for that response, and thank you for all of um, all of uh, the things that you were able to present to us today. Um, so that's about our time. 
if there are no other questions. Um, and I just want to thank you, Professor Gotabe, and would in, uh, like to thank all the people who asked questions today as well. Um, so there was a question early on about whether or not this would be available. Yes, this talk will be available on our CGS um, page, and there'll be a link um, as well on our CGS uh, lecture series uh, YouTube channel as well, if people want to follow up or share this fascinating talk with your, your colleagues, students, etc. So uh, please join me in thanking um, Professor Masaki Mike Kotabe. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, absolutely, our pleasure. Yeah, thank, thank you. Everyone. Take care. Okay, bye now.